Okay, we're recording. So I'm going to talk about um, um, Hebbian learning and the connection with um, the Infomax principle. Uh, most of most of what I'm going to discuss came from um, this paper from 1988, uh, which I went through. Now was written by Ralph Linsker. Um, now there's a lot of nowadays there's a lot of um, uh, momentum behind um, uh, using mutual information as an objective um, to learn representations. Uh, over the last few years, there have been quite a, quite a few papers, and, and they've gotten some really good results. And they've all they've all cited this. And also, I think another motivation for 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 reviewing some of this stuff is because um, for, for a few of us, we you know where mutual information is involved in the in the work that we're doing right now. And um, since since there is a connection here with Hebbian learning, it's nice to be able to tie it back and say, you know, even even though we are using mutual information as an objective, um, there is some there is some neuroscience tie here. So. So this is a paper. Okay. So in everything I talk about, um, this is the underlying framework that we're going to assume. So we have a um, we have a bunch of um, presynaptic cells. They all have activations x1 through xn, and then an output which is which is y, and they all get summed together uh, in a pretty usual way, which are all which you've all seen before. Um, so the Heb rule, uh, which I'm assuming most people are also familiar with, and I'll re review it again here. It's just the change, the way that the W, the weights get updated is proportional to um, the activity between the output and um, the input of each individual presynaptic cell. So, um, so first, um, I'm going to talk about how um, there's a, the, a connection between heavy and learning and principal components analysis. And then from principal components analysis, I'll try to make a further connection with, um, with, uh, with Infomax and mutual information. But for now, um, let's just talk about how um, heavy and learning is connected to um, PCA here. So PCA is a, a dimensionality reduction technique. And um, what, what, what happens is when you have a bunch of data in, in, in a high, potentially high dimensional space, you're finding, the, you're finding the axes that give the largest variation in the data. So if you were to project all these data points onto um, E1 here, then you'd get, you'd get the maximum spread in the data. So most of the information is preserved. And if you try to reconstruct the data um, projecting onto just E1, that's the one, that's, that's the one direction um, that you can project onto that will give you the best reconstruction error, um, and you can and you don't just have to pr project onto one dimension. You can project onto multiple dimensions, but the constraint there is that these um, these different I guess these different eigenvectors which you're projecting onto all have to be um, orthogonal to each other. So the eigenvectors are just the um, or, or these vectors that you're projecting onto that define the the surface that that you're projecting onto. Um, are the eigenvectors of the um, covariance matrix of the of the data points that you have? So if you just project onto the first, um, so if you just take the the eigenvector, the principal eigenvector, which is the one corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of that covariance matrix, then th then you're preserving um, the maximal amount of information in the data. And then when you go to the second um, eigenvector and you project onto the first two, then you're you're preserving the information. You're you're preserving more information, but not, now you have more dimensions um, and, and, and so on. So, uh, so there's a relation between this and and, Heb and Hebbian learning so far. So let's just um, so this is the Hebbian rule that I showed a little earlier, and this is all it's saying is the change in the weights is proportional to uh, the output and the, the presynaptic activation. So the and and I and I have angle brackets here. What the angle brackets represent is just this is averaged over a uh, over a large batch. Uh, and, all, and all the references I looked at, this is a very common notation to use. So instead of just having um, one example, you'd have multiple examples, and you just average it over this item. And so now with a bit of manipulation, we get a new. We're going to end up with a new um, learning rule here, and so what I what I did here is to get from line one to line two, um, y is just simply equal to this um, this linear transformation of x, and then and then I pull I pull the w uh, I pull the um, the weights outside these angle brackets because um, this the weights change at a much slow on a much slower time scale than the x's do, um, and then ultimate and then what what we get is something that looks like this. And um, you'll notice you have, we have um, the x's, 
um, being multiplied with each other. And that is, and that can be interpreted as the um, covariance between uh, multiple uh, individual data points. And so what we get is um, the change in a particular weight is just um, the covariance um, uh, between between that uh, between a certain data point or between that weight and another one um, summed up and this, and this so and so this is called the correlation based plasticity rule and this is um, basically equivalent to the Hebbian learning rule except uh, it, it's I guess it's a it, it's a it's a different way to state it over a large number of examples so the so the the relationship between um, the data points uh, tells you quite a bit about how the weights are going to change. Hey, Karan, yeah. this, yeah. this assumes that uh, these are all zero mean yeah. vectors, right? Yeah, yeah, I, sh okay. I should mention that. So there's an assumption here that about, um, everything having zero mean, because otherwise you couldn't, you couldn't take the covariance matrix like this. Now, okay, so that, that's all nice. Um, that, that's a, like a nice, I guess, something we have in our back pockets. Uh, but now let's uh, actually try to relate it to something else. So, um, so but by the way, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of math and derivations these next couple of slides, but I'm trying, I'm, I'll try to make it as uh, intuitive as possible and not go um, too deep into it. Okay, so we know why is the output of, uh, why is the postsynaptic cell? Uh, now, we can now, now we can ask the question of what, what is the variance of Y? Right, and so as Subhita mentioned, if, if we assume that y has zero variance, then um, it's gonna we're gonna get something that looks like this because uh, this this y bar here just becomes zero, and so and then we can rewrite y itself as w transpose x. And we get something that looks like this. Now, with a little bit of manipulation, um, I can get I can pull the x's together and get x x transpose, which is which just turns into the covariance matrix. If you have if if the x's are already centered at zero, which is what we're assuming here, and so we get something, and so we end up getting something that looks like this. And this and this gives the variance of y. Well, now we can go one step further and say, well, how if we want to maximize the variance of y um, with with gradient ascent. What, what would the gradient look like um, for each weight? And it turns out, all, and all we're doing here is differentiate, differentiating this term uh, with respect to wi, and we get something that looks exactly like the correlation-based plasticity rule on the left here. So what I've just sh um, shown, shown you here is that um, if we're using Hebbian learning, um, if we're, if we're using the, 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 the vanilla Heb rule, then we have, um, an update rule, which is basically equivalent to maximizing the variance in the output. Okay, and now this this relates to PCA because PCA is finding um, finding um, principal components that are maximizing the variance of the data itself. So in some sense, this this is um, this is doing this. So just doing heavy learning itself, um, the update rules correspond to basically doing PCA on the input. So this is just picking the first principal component. Yeah. So the yeah. first eigenvector that you showed. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And so, so here I'm assuming that you only have, um, you're only, you're doing your PCA onto just one dimension, but you could have this with multiple outputs. So you could have like a Y1, Y2, Y3, and it would, you still end up getting the, the same result. Okay, so that's, that's one argument for why, um, uh, I guess Hebbian learning is equivalent to doing PCA. Now I have a second argument, um, which is actually not from the Linsker paper. This is from Bruno Olshausen, uh, a write-up that he had uh, about ten years Can ago. Can I ask one one question before you move on? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, uh, the justification for the zero mean assumption. So I, I I guess in the in the algebraic manipulation that's done here, you need that zero mean assumption. Um, but to be honest, I'm not sure what would happen if you didn't have that assumption. I mean, it's possible. Well, that what would happen on, on your second line on your on your on your second column where you have the uh, average of y squared? There would be another term would be a subtraction of the uh, square of the mean in there. I'm not sure what that then does to the rest of your calculations. Right. I, I think if there is a bias term, maybe that takes care of, maybe that can uh, handle the subtraction of the mean. Yeah, but it's going to, um, it's not necessarily going to be a static bias, is it? 
if it's a it's a function of the uh, uh, the outputs. No, that's true. Yeah. Okay, I, I was I was just kind of curious I mean, if there was a, a neurological uh, uh, justification for a zero mean bias. A zero mean. Uh, I guess that's, that's, that's I'm, sorry. All that, um, I'm not even uh, that, that I'm not clear on either. It's, so maybe maybe um, this wouldn't be lifts wouldn't look exactly the same if we didn't have the um, zero mean assumption. Yeah, okay. okay. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so that, that was one argument for um, uh, heavy and learning basically doing PCA. Uh, now I have, I have another argument for that, um, which is uh, a bit it's, it's much much more mathematical and I'll try to go over it as smoothly as possible um, and this is not from the uh, from the from the Linscar paper this is taken from another source um, but I, but I really liked um, the way this was fleshed out so the argument here is that if you have a single output uh, single output cell which is y um, post a single postsynaptic cell then w uh, which is the which is the weight vector uh, will basically converge to become the principal eigenvector um, that that you would find via PCA2. And if you have multiple of these weight vectors, because you had Y1, Y2, Y3, and so on, multiple output uh, units, then 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 what one uh, one each, each weight vector would converge to each um, each eigenvector that you would find in PCA. So so now, now how does this work? So um, the correlation-based plasticity rule, which we got on the last slide, written in um, written in vector form, is basic basically looks exactly like this. Okay. Now what we can do here is diagonalize the covariance matrix so that you have um, Q written as E times lambda times E transpose, where where lambda is this diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues across the diagonal and um, Big E here is this uh, matrix where each column uh, is the is corresponds to an eigenvector of of Q of the covariance matrix. Now, once you have that, we can introduce a change of basis. So now instead of working with W, we're going to be working with V. So V is just um, basically the each um, eigenvector multiplied by the inner product of each eigenvector with um, with the with, with our weight vector w, so once we have that, um, the update rule for v instead of w because now we're interested in v just becomes chain the delta v is lambda times v, and now this is an ordinary differential equation, um, so we have the tools to solve that, and all this becomes is um, uh, I write it as a function of time, so since it is being updated over time, so v at time t is um, the initial value of v at time zero times um, e to the power of lambda times t. And so what's important here to note is that is how this would change over time, right? So the lambdas are the eigenvalues and they all, they're all strictly positive because that's just an assumption based on, based on the covariance matrix. Uh, and so the one uh, that is the largest will tend to dominate as t goes to infinity. So if, if lambda one is the largest eigenvalue, then this vector V will converge to the value one, zero, 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 zero. And, and since, um, and, and, and so if V is going to one, zero, 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 then that means in our original reference frame, which is uh, that for W, W would, would converge to the, the principal eigenvector itself. So that might be a lot to digest here, but um, this all, all this is doing is showing that um, mathematically that W the weight vector converges to the principal eigenvector, and so and so that means that doing heavy and learning would uh, basically is the same as doing PCA. Okay. Again, I just want to be careful a little bit. When you say it's equivalent to do PCA, it's just picking up the first component. Yeah. First principal component. Yeah. There's so far you haven't shown any way to get successive principal components through heavy and learning, uh, right? Because you need some competition between the units. Otherwise, yeah. every unit is just going to pick up the first principal yeah. component. Yeah. Um, in this uh, presentation, I'm not going to talk. I, I, I'm not going to go over that. Uh, I could have, but I, I guess I'm, I'm not going to. Um, but it was. It was argued in in the paper that that is exactly what happens that that each 
as you add more output units, they do tend to pick up more and more. They tend to yeah, pick up uh, orthogonal um, vectors. Yeah, but I think you need something more than pure heavy, and I think you need some competition, if I remember correctly. Um, I forget if it was Linsker or Oya who did that, but you do need some competition between the output units. Otherwise, they're all getting the exact same input. Yeah. So they're all going to pick up on the first principal component if there's yeah. no interaction between them. Right. So in um, I guess here one um, one constraint one constraint is that we want these um, eigenvectors to be orthonormal. So they do have they are constrained to have uh, um, a norm one. And if you use the Oya rule instead of the the vanilla Heb rule, then you do get um, yeah. that yeah. the weight vector tends to have a unit norm. So in that case, it, it's more clear how this would converge. Um, when you have multiple, uh, when you have multiple output uh, postsynaptic cells, right? I mean, I, I agree with Subutai. You need some kind of competition built in uh, for for it to for them to learn different ones. I think. Yeah. yeah, I think I think. Oh yeah, might have had a maybe that was the rule Karan you're referring to. I think. Oh yeah, did a version of Heb rule where there was competition. I don't remember the details now, but there was something like that. What does competition mean? Does it mean like that? Like, like, like maybe some kind of like winners greater... take all, maybe? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Something something where all the cells want to become active, but but can't become active at the same time. So they try to learn various receptive fields that allow them to come, become active, something along those lines. Okay. I guess that is one. Um... One gap in my understanding right now about how you they would how it would pick up multiple principal components and not just the same one over and over. Okay, so uh, now so I talked so far about um, how heavy learning uh, picks up the first principal component and um, does and, and, and is in some sense analogous to principal components analysis. Now um, I'm going to try to I'm going to make the transition from going from PCA to um, the info to um, preserving mutual information between input and output. So the InfoMax principle um, is basically stated in two parts. So one goal is to maximize the total information conveyed um, by the output message Y. And the second one is to minimize the information that Y conveys to, to one that already knows the input message X. So one way to think of this, or at least how, I, how I've been thinking of this is that um, going back to our PCA diagram, um, if you're maximize, if you're doing number one, which is maximizing total information conveyed about the output message, then you'd want to find that principal component that is uh, gathering the most amount of variance in 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 your data itself. But at the same time, if you want to minimize um, the information that Y conveys to some to um, if to to one that already knows the input message X, then you would you would then you'd want to pick up. Um, I, I I read this as wanting to pick up. Uh, um, I guess saying basically saying that your the next component that you pick up e two would have to be orthogonal because because uh, it, it, it it in some sense um, or you you wouldn't be gaining anything by picking up e one again so that's kind of how I'm reading this now um, now there's a hand waving argument that I've uh, sort of convinced myself is true. Um, from going from, so by the way, I just want to say that I, I didn't come across anything too formal for why PCA is in fact equivalent to InfoMax, um, but but I, I'm sure there's stuff out there. I just haven't um, gone ac come across it yet. And and in, in the few cases where Linsker was getting rigorous, um, there were a lot of assumptions made about the out the structure of the the inputs and the outputs, which I'll get to on the next slide. But for right now, just to give an intuition as to why I see PCA being um, being very related to InfoMax is, is for the following. So here's our, this is what mutual information is, right? It's the entropy in the output Y minus the entropy, minus the conditional entropy of Y given X. So uh, if we're maximizing, if, if mutual information is maximized, that means that the, the entropy here, H of Y will be really large and the conditional entropy will be really small. So the first part, H of Y is really large. Um, we are maximizing the variance that Y has. So Y is not always going to fall um, fall to a straight number, uh, to fall to one number. You'll get a lot of range, and that is and that's because the, the principal component that you pick up is um, going to have the most amount of variance in it. And so you'd get um, a distribution over 
um, P of Y that looks that looks re relatively flat and it won't be too peaked. And so that means that the entropy will be large of this distribution. Whereas um, when you have Y given X, you'll have something that's a bit more peaked because it's it's conditioned on X. Um, actually, that might, that might not be the best argument for why this is. Um, I guess th this, this second part here could relate to um, could relate to this um, item number two in the Informax principle, right? Right. So if, we were, if we're minimizing the information that Y conveys to one that already knows the input message X, then um, then this this item is minimized, right? So this I guess this having this second term be really small is exactly the same as um, number two, but but now I'm not relating it back to PCA. So uh, I don't know. I, I had. I had this uh, really peak distribution in my mind when I thought of the conditional distribution of Y given X, but it's, it's escaping me now how that relates exactly to PCA. But anyways, um, okay, so, so that, 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 that's sort of my hand-waving argument about um, how I see um, PCA being related to, um, to InfoMax. Now the second one, which is a special case uh, which uh, Linsker talked about, and also I found a nice, I guess, uh, a sentence in this in this textbook about it. Um, basically says, for Gaussian input statistics, so so now we're assuming that X is um, distributed Gaussian, an output that is corrupted by noise that is also Gaussian. So now we're assuming Y is also Gaussian. Um, maximizing the variance of Y by a Hebbian rule maximizes not only the output entropy but also the amount of information that Y carries about X. So this here, now we're assuming that the inputs and the outputs are both Gaussian distributed. And um, in that case, um, you using a Hebbian learning rule would maximize the mutual information between Y and X. And so uh, Linsker talked about this in the paper. Uh, he went into some, to some details of it. He, he skipped a lot of proofs, um, but the, the main idea was there. Um, but this is a very, this is a special case where you are making this assumption. And so I, I haven't come across anything yet, which shows that regardless of what we assume the distribution to be over the input and output, that it is indeed maximizing mutual information. Okay. So uh, there's also, so I, I mentioned uh, near the beginning that there's been a lot of recent- Probably, work. I mean, uh, uh, the, I mean, PCA really relies on a Gaussian assumption, I think. And so, in general, all of this, I think, assumes some assumes that the input is uh, Gaussian in order to make any of these statements. What is what? Which variable does PCA assume the Gaussian over? Like the, dis, the input distribution is distributed as a, as a Gaussian. I mean, you can see. Um, yeah, I, I, I think. There's a the that it's a multi that it's a distributed as a multivariate Gaussian in in that case, I mean, because it's it's basically just picking up on the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, which is kind of the definition of a multivariate Gaussian. But if but if we didn't have the multi uh, the the Gaussian assumption, but we still had the, the zero mean assumption, that would still that would still work, right? Or no? Uh no um. I mean, if you had some sort of a weird nonlinear distribution, then you can have other things, other ways of maximizing the, the variance. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you're not all, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, this, this really assumes a linear system in Gaussian inputs, I think. I, I guess the test case would be if it was bimodal, if the zeros, I mean, it, it averages to zero, but there's no presence at zero. Would this still work? Yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't aware of the, the Gaussian assumption in, in PCA, but if that's the case, then I guess this assumption, this special case makes a lot of sense. I think um, for PCA, like if you derive it using finding like the direction of maximal variance, uh, assuming zero mean, it works without it being Gaussian because you're deriving it with, uh, your optimization objective is maximizing um, the variance. And if you explicitly solve that, you will get like the first eigen uh, vector. But you can also derive PCA 
uh, as a maximum likelihood estimation on a Gaussian. And so like that assumes it's a Gaussian, right? Because you're, you're parameterizing the distribution as a Gaussian and then doing maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and then you'll get like an equivalent, like it's, it's an equivalent way of deriving it, but one doesn't assume a Gaussian, one does. Okay. Got it. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So there, there's been a lot of work uh, that uses um, mutual information for representation learning, um, and so this. So, so for example, one, one example, one popular example is um, CBC paper from two three years ago, which is um, building up representations of inputs uh, using using mutual information as their objective. And that's later being used for downstream classification tasks. Another one is Deep InfoMax, uh, which, is all, which is also doing the same thing, um, building up representations that are used for downstream classification tasks. And um, after going through a lot of um, the, the, the connections between Hebbian learning and, um, and PCA and, uh, and, and InfoMax, it's made me wonder as to um, why this has why these methods have outperformed um, just regular straight feedforward classification um, since since it seems like what they're doing it, uh, is is very linear. So PCA is like a is is, is a it's a it's a it's a linear uh, projection of your data onto a lower dimensional space. But here, um, if, if if we assume that these methods are are just indeed doing PCA in some sense because because they're doing um, um, InfoMax, then then really just doing PCA should yield really good classification accuracy results. But they've seemed to have done a lot better than a lot of these previous methods. Um, so that's something that I've been thinking about because it, it's just really impressive how this this works so much better than I would expect it to. If, if it is if it is just doing PCA, or or maybe it's not. Maybe there's something more here that I've uh, completely missed. Okay. Um, so just to recap, so the presentation is pretty much done, but just to recap, what I did was I showed that, um, I tried to show that Hebbian learning rules um, are analogous to principal components analysis. And that in turn is very analogous to, um, to the InfoMax principle to, to uh, maximizing mutual information between, between the presynaptic and postsynaptic cells. And so in that sense, he um, using Hebbian learning is very much related to doing um, to InfoMax. And the reason why that's of interest uh, to me and why I wanted to share this is because um, I have been working with uh, mutual information as an objective for, for learning uh, good representations in the, in, our, in the case of our dendrites project. And so it's, it's interesting that this now ties back to something that's much more biologically plausible. So that, that's it. I think the, the one thing I can possibly think of is when you're asked, when you're wondering like why PCA doesn't work. I mean, it, as you say, it's trying to maximize the amount of information that Y is caring about X, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good at trying to maximize that amount of information as opposed to other techniques. You're talking um, about- um, Like just uh, because it has that objective. You're talking about what I was- Yeah, as you're reflecting on this side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like maybe it's, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of mathematically equivalent to what these things are trying to optimize, but it may not be as effective as what these things are, uh, like yeah, in the because, actual way that it goes about it. Yeah, because I mean, all these techniques are using um, multi-layered deep neural networks and then just using mutual information as their objective. So they have a lot of non-linearities built into it, right? So they could potentially... Uh, find a solution that PCA won't won't find even though they are in theory equivalent I'm, I'm not sure but but I guess well, they also could be a bit more direct yeah well, I mean it sounded like PCA is and not say is it equivalent or is it just approximating um the info max so I know under the under the um under the assumptions which I showed on the slide before this about um inputs and outputs being Gaussian distributed then it is equivalent um but otherwise I'm not sure if it's. I'm not sure if it's always equivalent, or if there are edge cases where it's not necessarily equivalent. Hmm. So yeah, that, that could be that could be the 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 weak link. 
I mean, I thought the contrastive predictive, contrastive stuff did something more than just maximizing the mutual information. They're also minimizing the mutual information across different classes, at which the pure information theory stuff doesn't have any notion of classes in there, right? So the idea being, I mean, pure information maximization is, uh, you know, you're just trying to, you're, it's sort of a compression mindset that you're reducing the representation, but you're carrying as much information as you have about the inputs. You, in theory, you could decompress it and reconstruct the input. I mean, that was the whole kind of original motivation for Shannon. Um, and whereas the contrastive stuff says, we don't, the, the most important thing is to make sure we, well, it, we want to, create, uh, maximize the information with the input, but we also want to minimize information with inputs that come from other classes, right? And that's, you can think of this as a, another loss function or regularizer as another, another constraint that we're putting on it. Um, and I think that's why the contrastive stuff has worked really well. So you can think about here, you know, you have an image of a cat and a dog well, maybe those, that's not a great example, but you know, maybe an image of a cat and a dog. It's one thing to say you just want to compress these images and be able to reconstruct it irrespective of whether it's a cat or a dog. It's another thing to say, I want a representation that really is helpful at discriminating between cats and dogs. And they may be in you know, a particular feature that is really important for discriminating cats and dogs. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what that would be, but <laughs> maybe the stripes on the face or something like that. Um, and so those features would get extra weight that if you just care about, uh, you know, reconstruction, you wouldn't give those features extra weight necessarily. Right, so I think this contrastive piece is really key. Um, and in the past, uh, I think people have tried to just stack pure information you know, just pure Infomax kind of networks stack them and they don't get great results, but it's the contrastive piece that really starts giving you good results. Okay, I so think it's some of the classifications. It's, it's the distinction between supervised and unsupervised ways of, of doing this. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Okay, because I always, I always thought that the, um, the contrastive piece was part of the objective that they use because, because that altogether formed a bound on mutual information. But um, I guess I guess that I, I never really thought about the fact that it's now it's now you have a, a supervised objective as opposed to an unsupervised one before. Yeah. It's it's yeah, and, and they've had variations of it which is still in theory unsupervised. Um, but it relies on the supervised thing like uh, this, you know, some of the CPC stuff, if you have a thousand categories in ImageNet, if you randomly pick images from the from your batch, you can assume with high probability it's from another class. You don't actually have to know it's which class label it is. All you need to know is that it's another class. And so you can separate, try to separate those representations out. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, I'm not. Uh, I'm I'm making. I'm sorry. I'm I'm making this comment without uh, fully understanding contrastive predictive coding. But uh, is there a formulation of it that tries to push the mutual information to an earlier layer and preserving the uh, differentiating information in the current or pushing it forward to, in other words, a separation of mutual versus non-mutual information in a uh, layer wise, or is it just kind of- It's uh, all in segregated? the same layer. It's yeah, all in the same layer. It's all in the, it's just, a, it's just an objective function that says given and given a representation, I want to maximize the in, well CPC. I think typically says I want to maximize the information for other representations that are belong to the same category and minimize mm -hmm. the information against representations that are from a different category. I'm just wondering if there's, um, but it's all a in form of. Layer. Okay, if there's a form of, of heavy and learning that tries to push things in, in, in that direction rather than keeping it in the same layer. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that question. Um, I think that has to be. I think that has to be, and maybe sparsity 
somehow does that. <laughs> you know, sparsity with boosting may sort of encourage that kind of stuff already or naturally, I don't know. Yeah, because it, it, it seems like you would you would try to drive as much uh, common signal across as few connections as possible. And then at some point, you know, differentiate if you wish, you know, further yeah. on out. But I mean, it's, it's I, 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 I like the space this is in. I just wish I knew more about it. <laughs> uh, I just, it's just a matter of me reading the papers, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, it's interesting, you know, the, you know, Quran walked through this kind of relationship with Hebbian learning and pure information preservation. So there might be some small variation to Hebbian learning that gives you the contrastive piece. Um, and uh, it'd be very interesting to see if there's something like that in, in biology. Well, you, you kind of made the case that there has to be because otherwise everything would gravitate <laughs> toward one shot. So uh, I think that's that's the essence of, of it's got to be essential to it because otherwise you would be hot firing all the time on just one channel and, and everything else would atrophy away. So there's, there's yeah, got to be something on those other components. Well, well, okay. So there's two separate things. One is picking up successive principal components for which you need competition. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. That's completely separate from the contrastive predictive coding piece. Right? Uh, that's okay. a completely orthogonal concept. Um, and so the, the first part, I think there's pretty decent evidence that something like PCA is going on. There's competition across units and, and so on. Jeremy might know more about this, but the contrastive piece, I'm not sure. Um, and I think there has to be something like that. It's, it's just such a powerful principle. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of like it the visual system. Something like that. Yeah. If you only had blob detectors, you know, you're, you're going to miss a lot. You need, you need differentiators. <laughs> so, you know, there's, well, there's... PCA will give you that. Yeah. So P just straightforward PCA will give you that. We give you the, okay. Just uh, to be clear, uh, you know, if you actually, if you do PCA on like natural images, you will find things that look edge like and have different, you know, okay, interesting. Okay. If you've, you, you've looked at DCT coefficients, Right. They end up looking a lot. But, uh, the low frequency ones are like gonna, edges, and then they get higher and higher frequency. Right, but they're not going to show up on the first principal component. All those are the right yeah. components yeah. beyond that point. Yeah, yeah. So I, right. I, what I'm, the, I was trying to drive off your comment, saying that people just tried to stack linear, you know, linear layers and had problems. It would be like you only had blob detectors. You need you mm -hmm. need these other components somehow. Yeah. Speaking of um, just having blob detectors, uh, Linsker did talk um, a lot about um, how you know we have you have different sort of um, you have orientation selectivity and all these different things happening in the in the in the visual processing system. And he tried to relate that to this sort of competition that you have among different postsynaptic cells. And and based on based on this Infomax principle, that's how everything that's how you're getting different um, cells that are recognizing different different things. I didn't get to that though. Uh, I ran out of time, but I, I do wish I had more time to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, the whole stuff that Bruno showed was um, kind of a, in, uh, you can think of it as an enhancement to all this. With PCA, you pick up strictly orthon orthogonal vectors, right? And, uh, and you're creating the most compact, you know, it's an information um, reduction that you're creating. If you're given, you know, you're creating the most compact uh, representation that can best reconstruct the input. What Bruno kind of showed, well, suppose you relax that, you allow having an overcomplete basis. Um, and that's, you know, that he, he introduced that using sparsity. Um, then the feature detectors you get end up looking a lot more, much closer to what you get in the visual cortex than if you just do pure PCA. So you can kind of think of it as, that's kind of the next step. <laughs> it's, it's not doing, it's not creating the most efficient representation. It's actually creating a redundant representation, um, uh, an overcomplete representation. And that has benefits in and of itself. But 
if, they, if you do that, then that's how you get receptive fields that really look very closely to what you see in V1. Um, that was kind of the groundbreaking thing that Bruno showed. Right, so um, that's, it all kind of related for us, you know, so a lot of this started from Oya and Linsker. Uh, and I remember when, when this paper came out, because I was just a graduate student at that point, it, it had a huge impact on the community. Just the thought that there could be a tie from between heavy and learning and information maximization and PCA and all of this kind of quote unquote optimal uh, notions of optimality and that something like the HEB rule and local learning rules that are in biology might actually be doing something that's optimal in some sense was a huge thing in the field. Um, that was a huge eye opener. But it was, sounds like it was very short lived, right? Uh, I, I mean, depends what you mean by short lived. I mean, we're still talking about it here today. <laughs> I mean, sort of, it carried on. I mean, then there's Bruno stuff, which had a huge impact on the field. And uh, I don't think, I'll, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the whole lineage, but um, to me, not much happened between what Bruno did until this contrastive stuff came into play. I think there was a long kind of winter as far as, <laughs> you know, this, this line of work goes, but okay. someone could, Correct me on that. I'm not. I'm not super sure. And, and do you think the the reason that winter exists is because of this distinction between um, this contrastive piece being supervised versus um, you be having unsuper being unsupervised in the in the original case? Hey, that could be. Um, I don't know when the first contrastive stuff came out. I don't know. If, I think it it wasn't 2018. I think it was before that. Um, Probably yeah. Uh, but. It, it, and again, contrastive, it's sort of, it, there's an underlying notion of being supervised, but there are unsupervised versions of it. The, the newer methods also don't rely, the newer self-supervised methods don't rely on the contrastive piece. So I know you're talking about the importance of negative pairs, but if you take work mm -hmm. like uh, BYOL, they don't require negative piece. They're just learning from a slow moving average learning, like a target network and an online network. And they only rely on kind of positive samples, right? Like, so you're learning- Yeah, but I think they're work. assuming that the other, I think they're assuming that their samples are randomly mixed. So the other samples are more likely to be the negative samples. Oh, there's no negative samples at all. You're just trying to, you're just trying to match with an augmentation uh, created by a previous version of the same network. There are no negative samples at all in these methods. I had to look at it. If I, from what I remember, there wasn't, it wouldn't work if you just did that with two category cases, for example. You need like lots of categories because then the other stuff in the batch is much more likely to be from other categories. I have to look at that paper again. Uh, it's been a while since I looked at it. I, I may be totally wrong. I'm not sure. Okay, I, I think we're done. Jeremy, were you going to say something? At, uh, one point there. No, I'm not. I'm not completely too familiar with the um, all the information theory uh, mathematic background, so. I'm having a hard time relating it to actual biology, um, but I'll dig it up a little bit. Okay, well, thanks, Karan. <laughs>